Good morning, everyone. Um, like Mick said, I, I have known him for a long time since I walked in the door, and uh, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, but uh, I, just, uh, I just wanted to just uh, say a little bit about myself. My name is Darren Dirksen, and I, uh, I was a pastor for 11 years. And then uh, just a, lot, a few years ago, I became a, a counselor at a, a homeless shelter called Phoenix Rescue Mission, where we work with those who are homeless and help them walk through their traumas, their addictions, and, uh, and point them to Christ. And, uh, and so that's uh, what I do. I just want to say it's a pleasure being here. Uh, you guys are very friendly, and I felt so welcome uh, just as soon as I walked in the door. So, But uh, really looking forward to coming underneath the Word of God with everyone today. So if you guys would, we're going to look at a really, really well-known story from the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 14, the crossing of the Red Sea. So if you guys would, grab your Bibles and turn to Exodus 14. And as you turn there, what I'd like to do is share a little bit about the context of this passage just to catch us up, and then we'll pray. We'll read the whole passage. It's a little bit of a longer uh, chapter, and then we'll dig into it, okay? Uh, So as you turn there, Exodus 14, the context is this, is that the people of God had cried out to God in slavery. Israel, they were slaves to Egypt, and they call out to God, and God had heard their cry, their prayers, and He had answered them and delivered them out of slavery. And... He had done that through 10 plagues, these these plagues that specifically attacked the gods of Egypt, the so-called gods. After the 10th plague, the last one, uh, Egypt gives them over and says, you're free, and Israel makes a run for it. Uh, God leads them on a journey. However, God leads them into this passage right here that we're going to read today. He leads them into this very difficult, almost just impossible situation. They're going to feel trapped, they're going to feel hopeless, but with God, nothing is impossible. God had determined that he would save his people by crossing through the Red Sea. And this salvation is the epitome of the book of Exodus, it's the epitome of the book of the the whole Old Testament, and even it's an incredible um, way of pointing to the ultimate salvation of God found in Christ that we see in the New Testament. And so what I'd like for us to do is, is as we read this, let's, let's go to God and ask him to really speak to us exactly where we're at uh, as we read this passage and dig into it, all right? So let's, let's pray. Father, we come to you um, so in need of you. Lord, as Romans 15, 4 tells us, everything that was written in the former days was written for our instruction so that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we would have hope. And God, we need hope. We need instruction. We need endurance. We need encouragement from your word, Lord. Lord, we need you and we need your word. So as we open this passage, Lord, I know many of us have probably read this over and over again, but Lord, I pray that you would really, truly speak to us, that you'd make us attentive, that you'd open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to love what you have to say to us this morning. We pray this in your son's beautiful and holy name. Amen. Okay, let's read together. I'm just going to read through Exodus 14, and then we'll dig into it. 14 verse 1, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back. Now imagine hearing that. You're free, and now he's telling you to turn back. And encamp in front of pi Haharoth between Migdal and the sea. In other words, in this area that's trapped. In front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots, war machines, and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them 
all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them encamped at the sea by pi Haharoth in front of baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground." And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen, then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went between behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. No one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the word of God. Incredible story. Um, in the Leonardo DiCaprio movie Blood Diamond, and yes, I just went from the Bible to that, uh, but uh, in that movie... The young African boy named Dia was kidnapped from his family and held hostage as a slave. He was made to be a, ch a child soldier in Africa, and if you know anything about that, they are heavily abused and made to do terrible, terrible things. He is finally, the boy is finally rescued by his dad named Solomon and a mediator and helper named Danny, who's played by Leonardo DiCaprio. But at one point on their way back home from slavery, Solomon, the dad, looks up in surprise to see that his son had turned a gun on them. The dad, in shock, slowly stands up, and he says in Swahili, Dia, look at me. Look at me. What are you doing? 
the tears start to form in the dad's eyes as he reminds his son about who he is and that he is no longer one of those people anymore. And he reminds them that it reminds him that there is at home is waiting for him incredible love. He reassures his son that he knows that he has done bad things in the past, but he is not that anymore. He says to him with tender authority, I am your father who loves you, and you will come home with me and be my son again. And he slowly reaches out to him and brings him into embrace. How many times as Christians are we like this little boy? We are a group of victorious people saved by the precious blood of the Lamb, freed from slavery of sin that we could not get out of ourselves, and we are on our way to the promised land. And then something happens, something devastating, or that big change happens, and that old self comes back. That anxiety gets in. The, the anger issue you thought you beat has come back. The, the drinking comes back. The, the feeling of just that empty loneliness and loss hits you again. And you're facing that old enemy again, tempted. You ever wondered in that? Man, was this Christian life worth it? It'd just be easier to go back into the sin. Have you ever even possibly questioned if your walk with God was real in the first place. See, if that's the situation, there is incredible, incredible hope. Absolute hope. See, God promises that His plan for His people is one of grace and power. And that is through a mediator. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at four points. One, we're going to look at the plan in this passage. We're going to look at the problem that arises in it. Then we're going to look at the promise that God makes and then the power that backs that up this morning. So let's look, take a look at this. Your outline is going to be is up there on the, on the board. First of all, God's plan. See, every coach has a plan for their team. Every engineer has a plan for the structure they're going to build, right? And God has a plan for his people and God is sovereign to accomplish it. He is governing all things, and He is going to do that. And we see that in verses 1 through 4. We're going to walk back through this just a, a, a section at a time, verses 1 through 4. It says this, notice God, and that this is His plan. It says, now the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihaharoth between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp opposite it. Uh, you're going to camp facing the sea, for Pharaoh will say, of the sons of Israel. They are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and they did so. They're going to turn back. Six times in these four verses, we see he, they are going to do this. God is going to do this. Six times. See, it is his plan. I have a friend who became a, a Christian, and, and she was going to read the Bible through, the, through all the way, front to back. And then nine, ten months later, she finished that and came to me. And I said, well, what, what did you get out of that? What questions did you have? And she said, uh, a lot of questions, but here's the deal. One thing stood out. God does whatever he wishes. And I said, you definitely read the Bible. As Psalm 115, 3 says, but our God is in heavens. He does whatever he pleases. See, he is going to walk in there, he's going to take care of the enemy, he's going to save his people, and he lays out exactly how he's going to do it. What a comfort to us that God is sovereign over this. But it also can be, I don't know, a little uncomfortable, at least for me, because it tells me I'm not in control, right? And, and his plan is rarely what we would expect. This is not the expected plan. In verses 1 through 2, the Israelites are commanded to turn back into a difficult situation, right? To reverse their course. Sometimes God asks us to stop and face some things in life before we move forward. And that's what he's doing. And it doesn't take a military genius to figure out that this is probably the worst military move in the history of the world. Come here between the mountains and the sea, and there's only one path in and out, and the army's going to come trampling through that path. And I wonder 
if you feel like God's plan for you has felt like that at times. And the whole purpose of this plan And this is why we can know that his plan will work is because the ultimate goal of the plan is to glorify God. You see, they are caught up in a much larger plan than just their own freedom. This is about the glory of God in this passage. This is the point of the passage, right? It's the the point of everything. And notice that the the freedom of Israel isn't even mentioned in verses 1 through 4. It is about his glory. See, they are caught up in something so much bigger. But it has to be this. See, if God does it for any other reason, he puts any other reason above his own glory and himself, then he's an idolater. He's worshiping something, putting something above himself. It has to be this way. He does everything for his glory. There's so many passages talking about what God does for his glory. Uh, Isaiah 43 tells us that's why he created us. Um, Not only is that why he created us, But he tells us also that the reason that he forgives sins in Isaiah 43 is for his glory. It tells us that's why Jesus suffered on the cross in John 12. It tells us that's why he's coming back. It tells us that's why the, that's the whole purpose of the whole ministry of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus has done and why Jesus tells us to do all things that we do. It's for his glory. And this is good news because it's not dependent on how good we are or how smart we are. It depends on him and his glory. See, the story of Exodus and the story of our redemption is all about God's glory. That's his purpose. May we be in awe of him. May we worship him. But here's the deal. The Egyptians would completely disagree. See, the scene switches here in verse 5, doesn't it? It's kind of like in the movie where, the, where the, you're in the movie, right? And the, the narrator says, meanwhile, back at the ranch. And we see something else is going on in Egypt. See, Pharaoh is about his own glory, his own plans. While, angel, while Israel changes their course, the Egyptians are changing their minds in verses 5 through 8. Look at verse 8. It says, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, And he chased the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out boldly. See, God has ordained this collision, hasn't he? And this leads to a major problem. And that's our second point. We're going to see in verses 9 through 14, the problem. See, they were feeling free and comfortable, Israel. They're camping out by the sea. I don't know if they're like cooking up s'mores and playing cornhole. I'm not sure. But they are are feeling so good. But then they hear the thunder of horses trampling. They see the billowing dust forming up over the hill. Flashes of light burst as the sun flashes off the metal war machines, the chariots, like lightning. Then a wall of the greatest army in the world appears stomping towards them in a storm of horror and control. Their minds race, their hearts sink and the people are filled with panic, trapped between the sea and the mountains and an army that's coming to get them. They are in such fear. Verse 10, if we go back into verse 10, it says, then, then Pharaoh drew near. The people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very afraid. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then what do they do? They turn to Moses, and they lay out three very biting and sarcastic questions. So let's look at these. In verse 11, remember, Egypt is known for its graves, right? The pyramids, they're known for their graves. And look at verse 11. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? I mean, so sarcastic, so angry. I mean, Egypt was like graves are us. And they're there making smart aleck jokes and comments just in a bitter way. And then it goes on. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? The why questions that we always ask come out, right? Why this? Why now? Why here? And the answer is, we've already heard the answer. It's for God's glory and for your good. That's why. And then verse 12, the third question they ask, is not this what he, we said to you in Egypt? 
Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. Right? We told you, leave us alone to live here in Egypt. That's not true. They did not, they didn't say that. In Exodus 4.29, they're begging and crying, get us out of here. And that's what God did. See, unbelief and sin, they just kind of create their own narrative to explain what, what they're going through. This is so common in us. The Egyptians, and, and here's the deal, the Egyptians were not coming to kill them. They're coming to re-enslave them. The Israelites are asking for the very thing the Egyptians are coming to do. I mean, good thing God did not answer their prayer with a yes. How often do we need God to not answer our prayers with a yes? See, they had forgotten the ten plagues, right? God demolishing the Egyptian so-called gods one at a time. They had forgotten his presence is right there in a giant pillar and cloud, of light. They'd forgotten all that he had done and gone to this idea of he doesn't get it or he doesn't care. And they want to go back to Egypt in verse 12. You guys, this is the language of addiction. I want to revert back to my old ways. You see, you can take people out of slavery, but it takes three things grace, truth, and time to take the slavery out of the people. We go back to the way we used to handle things. We're no different, but God is so merciful. That mercy, that loving kindness that we spoke of earlier, and God has three words for them through his mediator in verses 13 through 14, and these are for us today because we're no different. Let's look at these. Verse 13, And Moses said to the people, one, don't be afraid. Two, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord, number three, will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Look at these three. First, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And this, this, the word fear is plural. When we fear, we, we try to take control with anger, with fighting, with withdrawing. But as the Puritans always say, man, if you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. You'll stand in any storm. Number two, Moses says, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand right where you are and don't fight, don't flight, no face and look to the Lord. Don't trust in yourself, in your feet, running away, in your fist, take, putting up a fight. Trust the Lord. And then thirdly, be silent. The Lord will fight for you. This word silent, is, it means to, to plow or to engrave or to cut in. Man, dig into God's will, right? Because he is going to fight for you. So be silent. Stop complaining. Complaining just fuels the fear. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry and fearful, right? Plow into his will. As one person has said, Worry is believing God will get it wrong. Complaining is believing he did get it wrong. What incredible words from God through the mediator Moses. What words we need to hear today. We need the Lord and his mediator because if he cares for the sparrows, he's going to care for us and whatever we're going through right now. Turn to him. He fights for you. Do you hear that? He fights for you. He fights for me. See, God leads us into this place where where we can know our true dependence is on Him, and He gives us incredibly powerful promises. And so that takes us to the next next step. These promises, what are these promises? Verses 15 through 20. Look at verse 15. If we go back into the text, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Right? Have faith, not fear. Right? He's, he's saying, why do you cry to me? And I, and I read that and I'm thinking, um, because we're going to die? But he's saying, why do you cry to me? He calls Moses to command the people to step out in faith, to trust his promises. 
See, there is a time when crying out and praying more can just be an excuse for doing nothing. When you already know the Word of God has laid out what you should do, and you're like, ah, oh, no, I need to keep praying about this. That's just putting a holy sticker on procrastination. And it lacks faith. Man, take a step towards Him. And here's the deal. It doesn't take that much faith, does it? It doesn't. I grew up in, uh, as for several years in North Pole, Alaska. In Alaska, so I've seen 60 below zero. That's very cold. That's why I live here. <laughs> and in North Pole, Alaska, uh, the lake freezes all the way down to the bottom. And you could drive a truck on it. And some people do. But it's really interesting in Alaska, the, the newbies that show up, it, you could watch them go out to the lake and they're nervous, right? They put their toe out a little bit. They're like barely walk out like a little bit, right? And they, they get really nervous. And then you watch others that just run and slide across it, drive their snowmobile on it, drive their truck on it, right? It's a huge difference. But here's the deal. No matter what, the ice holds. Whether you have a little bit of faith in it or you have all the faith in the world on it, the ice holds because it isn't about how much faith you have. It's what you put your faith in. And God is much greater than any block of ice, let me tell you this. You can stand on Him. Now imagine two million people crossing the Red Sea. It has to be that some were going through there excited with all the faith in the world, like running the waters on both sides. I can just imagine running through like this high-five tunnel, right? Woohoo! One hand in one side of the water and one in the other right? And you can also imagine others, fearful, holding their stomach, crawling out there. But either way, every one of them is saved because of what they put their trust in. See, step out in faith, not fear, and trust His promises. Verse 16, if we go back to the text, it says this in verse 16, Moses, lift up your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. It's about his glory. And then verses 19 through 20 he stands, God stands between the Israelites and the Egyptians throughout the whole night in a pillar of cloud and fire that brought darkness to the Egyptians and light to the Israelites, enabling the Israelites to cross. See, God stands in between us and everything else. The cross assures that. God places himself between his people and every enemy so that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Everything is filtered by Christ. Nothing slips through unless it's God's will. He has placed himself between us and our sins and between us and every circumstance that will ever happen to us, even the difficult ones. And that gives us an incredible peace of mind and peace of heart. Isaiah 26.3 says, You keep him, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. See, his salvation is a miracle, but so is his keeping of you as you trust in him. And what is behind all of that? That's our last point today, and that's the power of God to save. Let's look at the power, verses 21 through 30, 31. We'll close with this. He keeps us, and this is incredibly good news for us this morning and tomorrow and the next day and eternity. Imagine, though, as I read this, we're just going to read this, I'll pause a couple times, but imagine you're there. Smell the sea. Hear the horses, the chatter, the little kids gathering to their parents. Let's do this. Verse 21 it says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Let me pause there. Man, this just, I just have to say this, it reminds me of the creation story. The spirit hovers over, right? The water's divided by land appearing up. This new creation's happening. 
Verse 22, And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, that's significant, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, the power of panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them. Didn't he just say that? The Lord fights for them. Even the non-believers are noticing it against the Egyptians. Verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. Let me pause there. Notice a couple times now it's mentioned the morning appearing, right? The morning watch happening. Why is this? Because their main God was Ra, the sun god. And not only that, but Pharaoh was known as the morning star and the image of Ra. And so was his son. And what is God doing here? At the peak of this so-called false god's power, he is cracking down and smashing it like it's nothing. He is saying, I am the only God. I am your only salvation. Look to me. And then I love in verses 28 through 29, we see this, that we see in one verse 28, all the enemies are destroyed. And in verse 29, all God's people walk on dry ground in salvation. And then verse 30, if you guys would read with me, let's go on. Verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the land of from the hand, I'm sorry, of the Egyptians. And Israel saw with their eyes. Remember, we, he said, hey, watch this, see this. Saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Verse 31, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people. They what? Number one, they feared the Lord. God give us eyes to see. They feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses, the mediator. And then what happens? In the next chapter, they break out in worship and song, just like we did this morning. Incredible, incredible story. But listen, we need to know this story, and we need to know this story well as believers. And even as a non-believer, you're not a believer. The great, great, probably non-believers in this room right now, you need to hear this story. There is salvation, right? And what is the point of this? This old, old story points to something even bigger. I like what Alec Moitzer says in his commentary on this. He says, imagine with me what an Israelite would say on the way to the promised land. They would say, we came out of bondage and a situation as a slave and under the sentence of death. God showed his power though. And I took shelter under the blood of the covenant. And I'm heading to the promised land, but I'm not there yet. But he is with me the whole way. He gave me the law and put me, in, me into this specific community. And he gave me his presence to be with me every day to guide me and to guard me. I mean, as a Christian, you would hear that and say, uh, that's my story. Why? Because there is a way more horrific enemy out there. The enemy of our soul is sin. And the consequences of sin is death and the deserved judgment of God. But there is hope, and that hope is in a person. Hebrews 3-4 through 4 tells us that Jesus is the true and greater Moses and mediator who mediates ultimately for his people. You see, this is a picture of the gospel. Because of him, there is a way out, and we can stand on the other side of the Red Sea of sin and stand on resurrection ground. Why? Because of the power of the gospel. Romans 1.16 says this, right? I am not ashamed 
of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all those who will believe. It doesn't matter who, Jew first and also to the Greek. See, the Exodus story is a little picture of God's greater story of salvation for all who put their trust in Jesus. And Jesus, he is the mediator who's greater than Moses, who did everything it takes for us to always be with him. For the joy of glorifying God and for our own good, he saved us from slavery to sin. And as he lifted his arms, like Moses lifted his arms over the sea, he lifts his arms onto the cross and over the sea of people. The barrier, the curtain that separated God from the people splits in two and we are forever, ever embraced. Not only in our salvation and slavery from sin, but in our growth and sanctification when slavery comes back to try to reclaim us because we're going through difficult things. And like the scared boy from the story I mentioned at the beginning, when our past enslavement to that sin tries to reclaim us and we are tempted to turn against or even away from our Lord, the Lord with eyes like a flame of fire looks into our eyes and with tender authority says, I am your God. I'm your Father who loves you. And you are going to go home with me. I have a plan for you. Don't be afraid. Stand firm in my will. Fix your eyes on me in my salvation. Be quiet, right? Because I fight for you. And take that step of faith. And it doesn't take that much faith. Trust me. Trust my promises trust my power, and trust that my presence is with you and there is no greater gift. And fill your arms with his embrace because nothing will ever separate you from his love. Let's pray. Lord, I think of the words from William Carrier that says that our future is as bright as the promises of God. And you, as 2 Peter 1, 4 says, you have given us great and precious promises that point to you, that reveal you, so that through those promises, we may become partakers. We would share of your divine nature. We get to be with you and escape from the corruption in the world that is caused by sinful, these humanly desires that you freed us from. Help us to walk in that, Lord, that we would glorify you in all things. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to stand firm and see your cross. Look through our circumstances and see your cross and be silent, Lord. Help us to, to engrave in, to plow in into your will, knowing that you love us and that you fight for us. You're so good to us, Lord. God, I love you. Thank you for what you've done for us. Please continue to change us. We pray this in Jesus' beautiful and holy name. Amen.